Amen. As you turn to Revelation 18, we'll review 17 and before and uh, move ahead. National Israel was made captive by six monarchies <clears throat> that surrounded her. They were God's earthly discipline of Israel for her disobedience, a disobedience to moral law and profane worship. Now in Revelation 17, God enacts his righteous wrath upon these same immoral monarchies that persecuted Israel. Their immorality was worship of the fertility goddess, the queen of Babylon, successively passed down to the final monarchy, the seventh, called the revived Roman Empire. Collectively, they identify a beast, if you look at Revelation 13, as being kingdoms. You can see that in verse 2 of chapter 13 and also in chapter 17, verse 10. The last being ruled by a kingly beast called the Antichrist. Prominent to the nature of the seventh and the last, collectively drawn from a ten nation confederacy, is a continued worship of the Babylon, Babylonian harlot, who sits in an elevated position over all of them, continuing to persecute God's saints, identified in chapter 17, verse 6 as followers of Jesus. But God through his angel informs John that the presence of this seventh empire and its king are nearing destruction. You see that in verse eight of chapter 17, witnessed also verse 11, 12. It takes God's wisdom to understand this. Verse nine tells us so. I think we ought to consider what's going on at mid-trip. Most of us just do not get the point. Things are changing dramatically at mid-trip. Changing for Israel, changing for the unholy trinity. They are going opposite directions before and after. Keep in mind, uh, we understand that the first three and a half years is peace given to Israel by the Antichrist. How does that work in view of what you read about in the last three and a half years? So we need to remind ourselves how it comes about and what really is the issue. And we'll do that. So I'll ask the question, maybe answer it myself, but at least you should query it in your mind too. What eruptive change comes at mid-trip? Well, the Antichrist displaying, as it were, his being slain, which we read about in chapter 13, verse 3, and then resurrected, compels all unbelievers we can find a reference to that in chapter 13, verses 5 to 7. To accept his kingship, to act with one purpose of mind, as chapter 17, verse 13 and 14 tell us, to wage war against Jesus Christ. What event appears to have pers persuaded the Antichrist his uh, and his united kingdom to a change of heart? If indeed he came at the beginning of the tribulation, when ten kings ruled but not as a kingdom, and he joined in with a loud voice blaspheming God, and he made Israel at peace in her Zionist unbelief, as is today. What happens at mid-trib? What is the catalyst that disturbs this comfortable, unholy alliance? Doesn't he bring a pig into the temple? Yeah, the, the two witnesses. The two witnesses in the temple. Do you remember that? What have they been doing for three and a half years? Witnessing. They've been witnessing to whom? To the Jewish nation. To the Messiah 
as being Jesus Christ, along with 144,000, along with the angel in the, mid, in the mid heaven. The whole world has been provoked by a message that is counter to the evil that is being represented in the first three and a half years. And when the heart of Israel flips, so also Satan's anger, because he's now been cast down and is only allowed the presence of earth, he can no longer have any presence in heaven. And he turns his wrath on whom? He was comfortable with Zionist Israel. He's not comfortable with followers of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. He's been after the followers of Jesus Christ from the day of the inception of the national status of Israel, hundreds of years before. He pursued the woman, Israel with a desire to stop any lineage of Messiah that was promised by God. And when he couldn't get that done, he went after her when she was carrying the Messiah to kill the son. And he couldn't get that done. And when he was an adult, he tried to get him in the, in the wilderness. Couldn't get that done. But he got it done at the cross. And what happened on earth? They had a Christmas party. You remember that? They had a Christmas party rejoicing. But the resurrection turned it upside down. And they lost all their mirth. You remember the story how it evolved for Israel? All of a sudden she becomes a believing nation. God said, clear back in the Old Testament, I'll bring the dry bones together, and I'll give her breath of life. And we've always said, when is this going to happen? It happens at mid-trip, and I mean directly at mid-trip, right on the dividing line. Right? And now the empowerment of Satan and the unholy trinity, spoken of in symbolic <laughs> language as frogs coming forth from them, slimy frogs, chases after the woman, after Israel. And those who are believers flee. God protects them. Satan goes after them two times and can't get it done. But since Satan is, cannot be found in flesh, he is not incarnate as a being. He makes incarnate his antichrist and the false prophet. And they are, at this point, turned from making a deceived peace with Israel in the first three and a half years to wage war against Israel because they are now saints of the Holy God, true saints, followers of Jesus. And they are flipped into the angry war against God. Now in the last three and a half years, it isn't just the bold judgments upon the unbelievers that we pay attention to. We're going to pay real sharp attention to the war that all of the earth, the unbelieving earth, the Antichrist, the unholy trinity wages against the Christ when he comes the second time. The battle of Armageddon, as we know it. Well, with that as kind of a background, We'll move ahead with my questions. So, the Antichrist and his United Kingdom have a change of heart at mid-trib. They become hateful to the preachers, the two witnesses, and those who have uh, given the gospel message. And uh, they follow Satan's desire to kill all of God's saints who now in mass numbers have come to believe Jesus as their Messiah. If you read Revelation 11, you hear the gospel heard and believed. If you read uh, chapter 12, you read about Satan's earthly war against Israel. We just commented on that. So in verse 16, by way of review in chapter 17, that's where we started really last week. 
Let me ask you this question. What is the first thing the Antichrist and his false prophet do to solidify a hardened heart that has no remorse even in the heart, hardened heart of their followers? What does he do to solidify his position? Sets up an image. Say again? He sets up an image in the temple. Well, that's what he does, but how does he empower that? The first thing he does to empower that is what? Get rid of the harlot. Because the religion of all of these empires from antiquity past is the harlot of Babylon, verse 5. It's been passed down from empire to empire through six of them by John Stein. The queen of heaven, the substitute worship of the fertility cult. I read you several articles even in the finding of archeology span in the last 40 years about this being present throughout antiquity. So they, if you read verse 16, it's a sharp statement that you may have never really settled your mind about. And the 10 horns, that 10 nation confederacy, which you saw, and the beast, which now rules. They didn't have a kingdom back in verse 12. He's now become the king of their kingdom. He's the seventh. He's the eighth king. Because in the first three and a half years, he served only as a mouthpiece. In the last three and a half years, he's the absolute ruler. <clears throat> because he forces worship upon them all. And they relent. Right? So in verse 16, the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will what? Love the harlot. That ain't what it says. What does it say? Hate the they will hate the harlot. This is the first time this has ever occurred. How in the world do you take the heart of a man that is convinced? Because the heart speaks to what the mind has finally resolved. This is your seat of commitment. The heart is the seat of commitment. These people for centuries have committed have been committed to the Baals and the Asherahs, to the Queen of Heaven, to the worship of the Queen of Heaven. All the way down. That was Israel's falling that God railed against and took her to Babylon by captivity. Took Judah to Babylon. And these at this point in time, all of these nations, even in the first three and a half years of the tribulation, this same worship has been going on uninterrupted. And now all of a sudden, the Antichrist interrupts it. Not only does he set up his image in the holy place and animates it, it says. We can understand the animation because we're into the robot industries. But he also does more. Wage he and those he's convinced to worship him. Now the true king over the ten nation confederacy has indeed made war against the harlot. And it says how they do it. They make her desolate and naked and will eat her flesh and will burn her up with fire. Gone. Do you see any tears? That tells me that the heart of those people is not remorseful. Usually when you take away a man's heart, he's pretty remorseful about what's happening. Doesn't happen here. How do you convince a whole world of unbelievers of, in the true God to believe in the Antichrist and his image and worship? Throw away all of their idols, which are represented by the many names of the harlot of Babylon. How do you do that? Verse 17. 
Why do the Antichrist and these nations do this? Oh, that he tells us. What's the understanding? Because God engineered it. For God has put it in their hearts to execute his purpose. Having a common purpose, not a divided one. And by giving their kingdom to the beast until the words of God should be fulfilled. So, it's a holy act of God to harden their hearts through a reprobate mind. To believe a lie. To execute his purpose, to give a united kingdom to the beast. And in verse 18, how then do we reflectively, historically, define the heart that was drawn to the woman. How do we understand that historically? Well, as a false religion, it started in Babel. Created by an evil mind in that time, fourth generation from Noah. To make sexual immorality desirable to the fallen nature of man. If you don't think the sexual drives of a 12 and 13 year old child whom I used to say, God's going to light a fire, it's how you handle it is how it's going to come out right or wrong. And every human has ever lived knows what that fire is like. But she was more than a sex idol. She is the embodiment of the great city Babylon the Great, verse 5. Now to be seen as an evil city passed down in secular life to the many that followed the worship of her God. By God's plan, she is to be utterly destroyed and left desolate. Talking about the city. You can't separate her immorality from the city. So chapter 17 dealt with her immorality. Chapter 18 deals with her economics and her politics. And as we move into chapter 18, we hit verse 1 last week in closing and just an allusion to verse 2. So I'm going to just give you, by way of review, verse 1. As you read verse 1, after these things, I saw another angel, another of the same kind, Alos, coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illumined with his glory. What follows in this dark world described in the fifth bowl judgment in chapter 16 verse 10 and if you look at that you will read these words and the fifth angel poured out his bowl upon the throne of the beast and his kingdom became darkened what's happening in verse 1 darkness has no substance light does when light came upon this darkness the whole world was illumined it says something starkly new is happening here that the whole world pays attention to in the darkness of the kingdom of the beast comes the illuminated right light of this angel and in verse 2, he cried out with a mighty voice saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. We've heard that one before. It was spoken to clear back in verse chapter 16. 
Fallen, fallen, chapter 14, wherever it was, I can't remember. And we find she has become a dwelling place of demons and a prison of every unclean spirit. A prison, the literal word is a haunt, of every unclean and hateful bird, the scavenger. So let's look at verse 2 in, in this, in, with these thoughts. Attention to this bright illumination is an enforcement with a mighty voice saying, Fallen, fallen is gravel on the grave. If you look back at chapter 14, verse 8, you will hear the prelude to that. Another angel, the second angel, Followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who has been made has made all the nations drink of the wine of the passion of her pornea, her immorality. So we have a prelude to that back in chapter 14. And it's now at hand to fulfill the prophecy of God's fierce wrath. What is the prophecy of God's last bowl judgment in his fierce wrath? Look at chapter 16 and refresh your mind about verses 17 to 19. And the seventh angel poured out his bowl upon the air, and the loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds, peals of thunder, and there was a great earthquake, such as not been seen since man came to be upon the earth. So great an earthquake it was, and so mighty, and the great city... The great city of Babylon was split into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell all around, all the Gentile nations. And Babylon the great was, was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath. It's not just tit for tat. This is way superior to hers. It's thumos orgai, wrath, wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and huge hailstones came down of 100 pounds. That sounds pretty awesome. Babylon's collusion with demons had been the occasion of chapter 9 in the sixth trumpet, where with the four that were released out of the Euphrates came 200 million right? To wage war on earth and take away a third of the world's inhabitants. They were joined by the previous release of a whole great number of demons from the abyss at the fifth trumpet in the first part of chapter 9 to join with all those that have been cast out of heaven along with Satan. I mean, we've got an army of demons. And how is Babylon portrayed? She's become what? The dwelling place of these, of demons. Babylon has indeed been a prison or a haunt of every unclean spirit, symbolized like unto the scavenger birds that Isaiah 34 referred to when he said, owl and raven shall dwell in it. Verse 3, for all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality, the queen of Babylon, Ishtar. And the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her. What kind of acts of immorality do you have with a false god? That's spiritual. We're not talking just physical. Men, women have physical immorality. This immorality exceeds into the spiritual. And the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. There's a lot said there. Beyond demonic possession is the accompanying sensuality. The word sensual has to do with pleasure seeking. As well as sexual perversion. Which is part of it. 
to have become drunk of the wine of the passion or the wrath, the word carries the implication of wrath of her immorality. It may be pleasure seekers, but they pay the penalty for their pleasure. <coughs> it is true that the merchants of the earth have become rich by consorting with spiritual immorality, for Babylon had plenty of sinful luxury to commit acts of immorality with her. You remember Jeremiah 51, 7? had prophesied this so clearly, and it just strikes me every time I think about Jeremiah 51, 7. Um, well, I've got it right here handy. Babylon has been a golden cup in the hand of the Lord, intoxicating all the earth, Jeremiah says. The nations have drunk of her wine. Therefore, the nations are what? Going Mad. This is the picture that's driven to us here in this verse. Belshazzar's feast in Daniel 5 at the conclusion of the Babylonian Empire of that day, of that long ago kingdom, is a prototype Babylonian sensuous banquet that led to the fall of Babylon and the rise of Darius the Mede. Daniel 5. The sensuous reveling of past kings is now to be amplified in the language that we're reading. And in verse 4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people that you may not participate in her sins and that you may not receive of her plagues. John's attention again demands that he hear this other voice. It's directed to a, another of the same kind of voice through another of the same kind of voice. Heaven calls as he did, as, the, as God did through the prophets before and Isaiah and Jeremiah and others. And later, through the multiplied voice of the apostles, same voice. It is a continual call for God's people to flee evil. Come out of her. Don't participate in her sins, it says. Here, Babylon being the supreme example. For she is going to receive her just deserts. Her plagues are her massive accumulated sins that are defined in verse 5. Clear back in 17.5 now in verse 5 here in 18. For her sins have piled up as high as heaven and God has remembered her iniquities. Looking at Babylon, God's mind remembers her original sin at the Tower of Babel, wherein her sinful pride tried to reach into God's heavenly domain. And now she is defiantly doing what? Piling up. The word piling up means to glue together or joining with that which came before. She's piling up. Revealing her unrepentant attitude against the authority of God. That is the evil spiritual tower that she first built. We looked at it as a physical tower, saying, ha, oh, ha, you can't do it, can you? Yeah. This is a spiritual tower of evil. And she's been permeating it through infectious means to all the nations that follow. Clear down to midrib. God 
has remembered her iniquities, it says. But his reconciled people are spared. If you flee when God calls. It says in Isaiah 43, Jeremiah 31, I will forgive their, your iniquity and your sin I will remember no more. Verses 6 and 7. Pay her back, even as she has paid, and give back to her double according to her deeds. And the cup which she has mixed, mix twice as much for her, to the degree she glorified herself and lived sensuously, to the same degree give her torment and mourning. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen, and I am not a widow, and I will never see mourning. And I'll add, for I will not repent. That gives clarity to this statement. For this angel is speaking to God. With a mind that parallels the prayer of the martyred saints back in chapter 6. How long, O Lord? How long? And you remember what God said? Not until I bring more martyred. Oh, I want it now. <laughs> well, here's the final answer. Here's an angel begging of God with a call to initiate the law of retribution. The Old Testament saints, even before the reading of the martyrs before the throne, Back in Psalm 137, and I'll, I'll turn there with you if, if you want to turn there. Psalm 137. We read what the psalmist said back in verse 8. O daughter of Babylon, you devastated one, how blessed will be the one who repays you with the recompense with which you have repaid us. That's pretty potent. Psalm 137.8. So as did Jeremiah the prophet call on God to execute his promised judgment on her in chapters 50 and 51. And others like Jeremiah. Indeed retaliation belongs to God alone. And the call of his saints through the ages has been that. The angel's request is simple. Pay her back, even as she has paid, and give back to her double. That is according to her evil deeds or works. And that evil cup, these words being used in this verse, that made others drunk with the wine of her immorality, just across the page in chapter 17, verse 2, whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality, and those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. Such follows the program of justice that was prescribed in the Mosaic Law and is now finished in God's wrath. Three sins are accounted to her in verse 7. First, her pride and self-glorification. Let me read verse 7 again so you have it fresh. To the degree that she glorified herself and lived sensuously, to the same degree give her torment and mourning. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen and I'm not a widow and I will never see mourning. What are the three sins? Her pride in self-glorification. Second, her lifestyle of sensual living as the great mother of harlots. And third, the deceived arrogance of everlasting power as the queen of heaven who would not repent. So, the angel says, give her torment. Give her torture. And mourning, give her grief. 
that only hell can deliver. Strong language out of the mouth of the angel. We shift gears a little. Verses 9 and 10. And the kings of the earth who committed acts of immorality and lived sensuously with her will weep and lament. They didn't cry when they took away their heart's desire and the harlot. But they now cry. What's being taken away? How do we determine our elections as to who will win? Prosperity theology. Right? A president does poorly and the nation is suffering in his economic progress, he's toast. So, and the kings of the earth who committed acts of immorality and live sensuously with her will weep and lament over her when they see the smoke of her burning. Standing at a distance because of the fear of her torment, saying, Whoa, whoa, the great city Babylon, the strong city, for in one hour your judgment has come. They're not looking at the heart. They're looking at the city. They're one and the same in character and presence. But now we're looking at the city, the economic and political base. So how do hardened sinners respond to Babylon's destruction? That's the question. Certainly out of a heart of selfishness, they weep and lament. Their loss of luxury that surrounded their life of sensuality with her is gone. Las Vegas just went away. Fearful that they may be next, they try to put space between themselves and the smoke of her burning. Familiar with the many tormenting judgments already enacted by God upon them, they had a mind that deceived them that such a great city, the jewel of Antichrist's empire, could be destroyed in one hour. It contains an air of hopelessness in their strident battle with God, that such a strong city should fail them. I would say it might have been like those who were aboard the great ship Titanic, as history records those hours. Verses 11 to 13. And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Cargoes of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and every kind of citron wood and every article of ivory and every article made from very costly wood and bronze and iron and marble and cinnamon and spice and incense and perfume and frankincense and wine and olive oil fine flour and wheat and cattle and sheep and cargoes of horses and chariots and slaves and human lives. How long a list do you need? So how do, how do they see this? Verses 11 to 13. The marketplace is gone. The place to go and exchange money and get wealthy and participate in harlotry. Sensuous living. God. The merchants of the earth who have both a parasitic but more so a saprophytic relationship. You need to hear those two words. With the city. Has been destroyed. Wall Street's gone. These merchants weep and mourn, it says, because no one buys their cargo.
cargoes anymore. The extensive list of luxury items, there's 20 of them here in number, are the items of wealth and greed, of the insatiable appetite of the economic heart of Great, ha uh, Great Babylon. We see a former prototype in Tyre. Oftentimes the Bible gives us pictures of selective little spots on earth that are prototypes to what comes in this greater enormous catastrophe of the end time. The economic disruption when Tyre was torn away really disrupted the Mediterranean and all the adjacent nations. The Phoenicians were wiped out. She being the merchant marine of that day is portrayed in like manner in these verses. If you look at uh, verses 14 to 16 in the beginning of 17, we read this. And the fruit you long for has gone from you, and all things that were luxurious and splendid have passed away from you, and men will no longer find them. The merchants of these things who became rich from her will stand at a distance because of the fear of her torment, weeping and mourning, saying, Whoa, whoa, the great city. She who was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour such great wealth has been laid waste. The inward selfish lament of both kings and merchants is now voiced toward the now deposed Babylon, reflecting upon her past splendors and the evil fruit thereof, saying, the fruit you long for, literally, of your soul's desire, is what the Greek, of your soul's desire, has gone from you. These men became soulmates with her. They were parasitic and saprophytic. For in their privileged commerce, they had to take the mark of the beast in order to buy and sell. We read about that back in chapter 13. But now no longer. This is a double negative in the Greek, and it means absolutely not even, not even scavenging is going to be allowed or seen. The merchants, now separated from the source of their selfish penchant, are not just weeping and mourning. Their loss, in their loss, they stand in fear that they may be next. The swiftness, for in one hour, of her judgment attracts a fearful attention and a breathless voice. Whoa, whoa. The last half of verse 17 and on into 19. For in one hour, uh, let's put it this way, and every shipmaster Verse 17, last half of it. And every shipmaster and every passenger and sailor and as many as make their living by the sea stood at a distance and were crying out as they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads and were crying out, weeping and mourning, saying, Whoa, whoa, the great city, in which all who had ships at sea became rich by her wealth, for in one hour she has been laid waste. Not forgetting the merchant fleets and the shipmasters who have enabled the merchants. Every passenger and sailor, it says, everyone who sailed anywhere. What do you think about all the ships out in Los Angeles? Are they saying, whoa, whoa? Not yet, but it's coming. So, every passenger and sailor, literally everyone who sails anywhere, stood afar, weeping and mourning over the loss of the great city. They are animated in Old Testament ways of grieving, throwing dust on their heads, while crying out, 
and loud voice, whoa, whoa. For them, it's selfish, an inward expression exposing outwardly. We have become rich by her wealth, and now we're laid waste in one hour. Verse 20. Rejoice over her. O heaven, and you saints, and apostles, and prophets, because God has pronounced judgment for you against her. Vindication for the martyred saints' call to judgment back in chapter 6 has come. God has pronounced judgment for you against her, says the angel to their hearing. So rejoice over her demise. Verse 21. And a strong angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will not be found any longer. A prophetic demonstration of casting a stone into the Euphrates rivers was given by Jeremiah. Look at Jeremiah 51 with me, if you would. Jeremiah 51, verses 61 to 64. That's a long chapter. <laughs> um, we read this. Then Jeremiah said to Sarah, As soon as you come to Babylon, then see that you read all these words aloud. And say, Now the Lord has promised concerning this place to cut it off. We're talking about Babylon the city. So that there will be nothing dwelling in it, whether man or beast, but it will be a perpetual desolation. And it will come about as soon as you finish reading this scroll, you will tie a stone to it and throw it into the middle of the Euphrates and say, just so shall Babylon sink down and not rise again because of the calamity that I'm going to bring upon her. And they will become exhausted. Thus far, are the words of Jeremiah in the day of the Babylonian exile. Now in the day of the final wrath of God. Verses 22 and 23, and the sound of the harpists and the musicians and the flute players and the trumpeters will not be heard in you any longer and no craftsman of any craft will be found in you any longer and the sound of the mill will not be heard in you any longer. And the light of a lamp will not shine in you any longer. And the voice of the bridegroom and the bride will not be heard in you any longer. For your merchants were the great men of the earth, because all of the nations were deceived by your sorcery. Interesting word. How thorough is it? No music, no workers, no preparation of food, no lamplight, no voice of husband and wife. Thus the sounds of life are gone. Three summary statements detail the egregious sin of the city here. She, we had those three egregious sins of the harlot who represented the city. Now three egregious sins of the city. She first had seduced by sensuality and greed the great men of the earth. The kings had fallen to her. Accumulating wealth to export, to, to export her diabolical evil to others. She did it by deceiving the nations. By use of sorcery.
parakia. What's that? Drugs, drugs. The drug culture. The occult practice of using drugs and magic in combination. In the King James Version, you oftentimes hear the word sorcery is pharmacopoeia, the drug culture. Do you know anything about the drug culture? Do you believe in fentanyl? Well, let's reflect on how it was seen by Paul. Did he know anything about the drug culture? Yep. Where was it at? Delphi, was it not? Herein is the immoral spiritual relationship. And thirdly, most egregiously, number three, her hatred of God's people. Verse 24. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and of all who have been slain on the earth. Most all of the wars that have been waged in the past have some connection between the harlot of Babylon and the economic prowess of Babylonian economic political power. Most egregiously, her hatred of God's people. She aggressively martyred the tribulational saints in the final hour. And to this end, she was to be held accountable to God. I will repay, says the Lord. And so the conclusion of chapter 18. You didn't think I could go through chapter 18. <laughs> <laughs> Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Oh Lord, we're held in awe, prophetical awe. We think it's bad. Nothing like what you've revealed will be. How evil must this world got before your wrath, wrath comes? Father, we stand in hope of our soon rapture. We stand in hope as do many before us that your wrath will be consummate and just. Father, this day give us the pleasure of your peace, the understanding of your promise. and the expectancy of your soon coming. We pray it in Jesus' name.